Hello students, welcome to EPG Path Shala. I am Dr. Vibha Dhawan from Terry. Today we are going to talk on the module Micropropagation under paper on plant biotechnology and crop improvement. Now what is micropropagation? Now there are two words, one is micro and other is propagation. So propagation you all understand and you understand micro as well. So what is micro here? Here we are talking of regeneration of large number of plants starting from a small tissue under aseptic conditions. So the micro part here is the explant. So propagating from small tissue. Since small tissue won't survive out under normal conditions, you carry out this under aseptic conditions. In this module, you will learn how micropropagation is practiced, what are the different stages of micropropagation, what are its main advantages and constraint of the technology and where are we in terms of commercialization. Now micropropagation, you will be surprised to know that this is the first technology which has been commercialized in the field of plant tissue culture way back in 1960. So it has a history of more than 50 years, almost 60 years that plant tissue culture has been commercialized and has benefited humankind on this planet. Why micropropagation first of all? Why do we want to clone plants? Many of you are aware if you have ever grown plants at home that many of the plants we propagate them vegetatively, we take cuttings, we don't grow them by seed. Similarly, when you buy fruits, you ask for a particular variety. You simply don't buy apple as apple. You want to ensure whether you are eating golden delicious or you are eating red delicious. So therefore, you how these varieties have been developed. Rose, similarly, like it's always grafted. So, in nature also, vegetative propagation is something which has been practiced to maintain unique traits of any cultivar. But tell me one thing, can you propagate everything that you feel? I like this tree, let me propagate this. Can you do it? The answer is no. And similarly, if you have one plant and then you say, oh, this is very nice and next year I require a million plants of this kind. Can you do it? No, because there is a functional size of the cutting that is required. Otherwise, it won't survive. And not that all species can be propagated vegetatively. So, that is where micropropagation has offered many advantages. First of all, you initiate your cultures from a very small explant, which can be anywhere between 1 to 3 centimeters. So that's all. Large number of explants can be taken from a particular plant. You don't damage the plant, but still by taking those cuttings, because each explant will be just one or two node uh, explants, two node segments, which you sterilize and put onto the media then you are multiplying it repeatedly because what happens in cuttings is that you wait for the monsoon to come. It's only during it during the rainy season or maybe a particular season in which you can take cuttings. But here you can actually carry out multiplication round the year. As you have learnt in the earlier chapter that in the growth room conditions are controlled. You maintain similar temperature, similar light intensities. So the irrespective of the season, same rate of multiplication can be achieved. And as I said that it is applicable to many more species, those which fail to respond to conventional methods of vegetative propagation in nature, they are amenable to tissue culture technology and you can multi multiply them uh, through micropropagation. The plants, they are multiplied around the year they are free of microorganism infection. Now, one of the biggest problem associated with vegetative propagation is that the plant is growing in open environment. So there will be all kinds of bacteria, 
fungi, viruses, they may attack. And so are the soil-borne pathogens. So the biggest danger of vegetative propagation is that if you take cuttings from an infested area, from visibly healthy plants, there are chances that they do are, are carrying latent infection, which then emerges even in the virgin area where you are taking these plants. You can plan your production. You can plan that in this particular month, I require so many plants. So therefore, depending on when the plants can be actually transplanted into the field, depending on that, you have your cycle of rooting followed by transplantation. The other thing is that in micropropagation, many a times the plant remembers its physiological age. And therefore, when you take these plants, they flower early. Thus, the gestation period for horticultural species, fruit crops, can be reduced considerably when you use micropropagated plants. Another thing which I would like to mention, and you'll be learning more about it, that in micropropagation, during shoot multiplication, we use quite high dose of cytokinin, which induces bushiness. Therefore, which becomes a desirable trait in many of the species, and you can go for high density plantation with comparatively lower heights, thus going for higher yields. Micropropagation is a well-defined multi-step process. Broadly, it comprises of five steps and each set his own set of requirements. Stage zero, so of course, this is a step which was introduced later and therefore we are calling as stage zero. That is the preparatory stage to provide quality explants. Stage one is establishment of aseptic cultures. Stage two is multiplication. And stage two is what is repetitive because you carry out repeated cycles of multiplication till you reach a certain level or level required number of plants. Stage three is rooting of in vitro form shoots. It can again be in vitro or it can be carried out outside. And stage four is transfer of plants to greenhouse or field conditions. Stage zero is the preparatory stage. Contamination is one of the most serious problem for establishment of aseptic cultures. And as I have said earlier, the plants are growing in natural environment. They are exposed to all kinds of microorganisms all the time. The contamination load may vary from season to season, but usually the growth period when the plant grows well and you can actually collect the explant, now that season is also good for the microbial growth. Like monsoon, it's good time for collecting the explants, but it's also good time for microbes to grow. Thus, it becomes extremely important for us to take care of the mother plant, uh, hygiene of the mother plant from where we are going to collect these explants. Most often, plants which are growing in the greenhouse, they give higher percentage of aseptic cultures. But that's always not possible for you to collect explants from plants growing in the greenhouse. You cannot bring a 30-year-old tree growing in the forest and to grow in a greenhouse condition. You can definitely multiply that. You, if it can be done vegetatively, you can make a cutting and then bring it. But it's not always possible. And so many times you are bound to collect material from field-grown material. So therefore, you there are certain procedures which have been developed. What will you do? You want to keep the bacterial load low. You spray with chemicals, which ensures that bacteria doesn't grow. Similarly, you spray fungicides. You cover it with polythene sleeves, loosely cover them with them. So it's not directly exposed to the microbial uh, contaminants. So that is how you prepare your explant. Many a times it's also, as I said, that as the tree in, gains in age, it loses its regeneration potential. So if you have to start from an adult tree, which is not responding to tissue culture, then you cut the stump 
and you take the copies. So that's even for cutting method also that has been practiced and it's very successful for raising uh, aseptic cultures. You also spray growth regulators like cytokinins, a very common practice specially done for gymnosperms so that the nodes, they become more responsive to tissue culture. You water it at subsoil level or just on the surface so you don't splash water. So that way also you can get aseptic cultures. The next stage is initiation or establishment of cultures. Now the aim of this stage is to establish aseptically growing cultures from the explants which then can be multiplied. So it is establishing those explants in culture condition. The success of this stage depends on a lot of factors, the most important being the appropriate explant, proper sterilization procedure and appropriate media that favors growth. When I say explant, it is what is the size of the explant? Is it collected during the right season? Again, there is confusion like most of the time in most species, the actively growing stage is the most responsive. But in some species, even dormant buds have given better result than the actively growing cells. You have to sterilize your explants properly. We'll be discussing more about it. But at the same time, the, your sterilization treatment should be good enough, should be harsh to the microbes, but very soft to the tissue so that it can pick up growth later on. And then what is the media? Because ultimately, it's the media constituents which brings changes in the shoot bud and then bring out the appropriate morphogenic response. Explant, of course, the choice of the explant, it depends on what mode of regeneration you require. If your objective is cloning, then of course you start with the meristematic buds, which is present in the apical zone as well as in each of the node. But if your objective is different, if it is in terms of getting large number of plants, then uh, you can also try leaf for adventitious budding. And if it is through callusing, then again, it can be any explant. So it depends on what is your ultimate objective. When your objective is virus elimination, then of course you start with the meristematic dome and that is where you use microscope because it's just the submillimeter meristematic tissue which is to be used. So once the cultures are initiated and depending on the explant, it will follow different routes of multiplication. There are three different methods one through callusing, the other one adventitious bud formation and third axillary branching. Now when we start from callus, there are two method, two modes which are followed. One is through somatic embryogenesis and the other one is shoot bud regeneration. So over there by changing, first of all you start with a differentiated mass of cells and thereafter, you make it de-differentiate, have callus formation. And through interplay of growth regulators, you can induce either shoot buds or somatic embryogenesis. I'm not going to discuss more about it because there are two other topics which will be discussed. One on organogenesis, another one on um, somatic embryos. So there you will learn the technology as a whole, uh, practices which are followed and so on. Now coming to the next method, which is adventitious bud formation. What is it? Adventitious bud formation is that you get shoot formation from any other organ than the node. So it is adventitiously formed. Something which is common in nature as well. You must have seen begonia plants throwing shoots from all sides, spider plant, again from the leaf end, another bunch of leaves appear and roots from the other side of it. So adventitious budding does happen in nature as well. 
in tissue culture what we are doing we are inducing adventitious budding in far many species than what happens in nature and at the same time the number of buds which are originating is manifold and these buds these leaves again can be separated and again put for further adventitious budding the beauty of this process is that the plants are usually clonally uniform large number of plants can be produced you don't injure the mother plant at all because you are just starting from a leaf portion so large number of plants can be originated can be made starting from a very small explant and they are true to type true to the mother plant the most common method used in micropropagation is forced axillary branching now let me ask you have you ever observed how hedge is formed why plants grow straight and of course branches do appear but they have limited growth and the plant keeps on growing tall and tall and many a times when the tip get injured you may have two branches taking the lead now the common observation when the hedge is formed what do you do you damage the tips the gardener they just keep on trimming the tips and the side branches keeps on coming if you observe plants carefully you will find that in the axil of each leaf there is a small bud present which remains suppressed so there is a strong apical dominance which does not let these buds to grow but when this tip gets injured or you remove it physically then these branches the axillary shoots they start sprouting they start coming up again one of them starts taking the lead and the other again get suppressed so that is what happens in nature now what happens in tissue culture is that you know that each in the axil of each leaf a small bud is present so therefore you take a single node segment you put it on a media and then make it grow what you are doing you are removing the top apical dominance is removed and then you are manipulating the growth regulators in the media so that these axillary shoots start developing of course in the chapter on media constituents you have learned that cytokinins favor shoot formation and auxins favor root formation it's not that you only have to add cytokinin in the media because ultimately it depends on what is the endogenous level of cytokinin and auxin in the explant tissue as well so sometimes you only add a cytokinin sometimes you add a combination of two cytokinins sometimes you add cytokinin and auxin and so on so that is where you have to define the media whether it requires high salt concentration low salt concentration so based on that you develop the media and you make these axillary branches grow and the presence continuous presence of cytokinin in the media that makes even on this shoot the axillary bud sprout so usually you have a cluster formation many a times it's also that the cluster is not formed the apical dominance in those species again is so great that it does not let the axillaries grow again so again over there the procedure for micropropagation is that you chop it into single node explants again take it to the fresh media so this cycle of shoot multiplication can be multiplied n number of times it's indefinite really speaking but most tissue culture labs they prefer to initiate fresh cultures every year one of the reasons is that any number of precautions that you might be taking there can be off types and you don't want to multiply it indefinitely you don't want very large number of plants of off type the other is that they do lose potential regeneration they become weaker and weaker and thus it is advisable but there are some species like banana 
which are very sensitive and there you must stop after seven subcultures. The duration of subculture again needs to be decided. The ob cultures must be carefully observed and you also have to calculate because your culture may keep on growing say up to six weeks, seven weeks, but the growth potential, growth, overall growth keeps on declining. And therefore, you decide on when should I stop, when it is more profitable for me, how will I get larger number of plants, should I stop after three weeks, should I stop after four weeks, should I stop after five weeks. So that is what you do an anal analysis, what is the manpower cost, what is the labor cost, what is the cost of keeping culture in the growth room. So if after three weeks, I'm getting threefold, after six weeks, I'm getting fivefold but then or six weeks I'm getting fivefold your culture is still growing but if I have done subculturing after three weeks my threefold then becomes three into three ninefold but if I let it on the same media it's only fivefold. So during shoot multiplication there is continuous presence of cytokinin in the media. This cytokinin is suppressing rooting. This cytokinin is also suppressing internodal growth. So the shoots they are stunted. For many species this is perfectly all right because once you take them to the rooting media while they are rooting they also gain in length. But sometimes it is that these stunted shoots they remain stunted and it becomes very difficult to make them survive outside. So another step has been introduced where we call shoot elongation. So what is it that we want to do under this step to achieve elongation of internodes? We want to get rid of cytokinin or we want to reduce the endogenous level and thus pick up growth. So the cultures they are shifted either to the basal media we sometimes even add activated charcoal so that it will adsorb cytokinin from the shoots and then once they have grown to a considerable length then we take them to the rooting media. In extreme cases we also introduce gibralic acid so as to favor growth of internodes. So thereafter once you have induced or you have good elongated shoots with you the final step is rooting of shoots so that you have a complete plant formed. For this the step is introducing rooting into these micro shoots. It can be achieved two ways one is to treat them as micro shoots take them to transfer area put rooting powder at the base and transfer it. Of course there is another technology available what we call as pulse technology where you dip them in very high concentration of auxin for 5 minutes, 10 minutes and so on and then transfer them to the potting mix. Good technology in terms of saving money, time and also that the roots formed in vitro normally they die. So here you are doing in one step that you are introducing functional roots. But this is not applicable to all species and therefore for most species we have to introduce rooting in vitro. It's a very high energy intensive step because it's another organ that plant is throwing. But at the same time this is the last stage of tissue culture and you want your plant basically you are preparing your plant to go to natural conditions. So you try to reduce sugar concentration, you try to reduce inorganic salt concentration and so on and many species it's not that it's the scientists who are trying to reduce these but many species they respond better because it's a kind of stress created and therefore the plant throws roots. So in this stage you reduce the concentration of the salt and concentration of sugar. So ultimately all this labor of producing plants that needs to be translated into success. So thus 
what is the final success rate? How many plants are we able to transfer outside? What percentage? So it's a very crucial stage because all your expenses related to production of plant has been incurred by now. So the survival dictates whether this is commercially viable technology or not. The plantlets, they are produced under artificial conditions. They are multiplied under artificial conditions. They look very healthy. They are green. They have good roots and so on. But at the same time, they are not efficient in photosynthesis. They lack mechanisms to control water loss because there was no need for plant either to photosynthesize or to take care of water losses. So the chlorophyll ratios are not in favor of photosynthesis. The stomata are non-functional. Cuticular waxes are not fully developed. The leaf morphology is abnormal. And thus, if you transfer them to the outside environment directly, the failure rate is almost 100%. So you won't, these plants cannot survive. Thus, you have to gradually acclimatize them. So what do we do for this acclimatization? Your first stage is that you have to realize what are the needs of this plant. So what you do is you transfer them to greenhouse, which is nothing but simple fan and padded arrangement, something similar to the desert cooler that you have at home. So in cooler also, desert cooler, one of the major problems is that the humidity of the room goes very high. But we require that for the plant. So what we do is we keep it in the that end of the greenhouse, which is closer to the pad, and then you move from that end to the other end. And this journey can take almost two weeks. So during these two weeks, the plants, the functional stomata starts developing, cuticular waxes start developing, the leaf morphology becomes more normal, the lateral roots appear or the roots which are formed in vitro, they are get replaced by the new roots which are formed. And then they can be taken out. The temperature in the greenhouse is almost plus minus 10 degree of the ambient temperature. You can maneuver light, you can put shade nets, you can also have vents if the temperatures are going very high. And after two weeks or so, when the plants are taken out, the survival is expected to be high. And really speaking, in a way, you are not satisfied unless and until you get 95% plus survival at this stage because otherwise it's not commercially viable. But in many areas, the temperatures are not conducive. They are very high or they are very low. So in that case, you take them to another intermediary step and that is maintaining them in polyhouses. So after the polyhouse stage, you take them to open nursery and that's the stage they are given to the grower because now they are as hardy as the seed raised plant and at the same time they have the desired traits for which you have done the cloning. These plants are virus free, disease free so that is another added advantage to the grower. We'll be discussing more about it that how this technology has brought revolution in banana cultivation in our country. It of course to some extent also in case of ornamental plants in other horticultural species such as pomegranate where it's picking up. So we'll be discussing more about it later on. In this module, you have learned about micropropagation, its various steps, precautions to be taken at different steps of micropropagation, the success of micropropagation and so on. So I'm sure you are convinced with this technology and would like to use it for the plants with unique and desirable traits. Thank you.